The idea for this program really originated about three years ago, maybe more actually, when um, then board president Eleanor Swift was presiding and I felt that with a 150 year program on, of women that we should update some of our photos and biographies of women that we have hanging at the club. Most of these are from the 20s and 40s. So there were six women that we felt were trailblazers, and two of them are Barbara Christian and Herman Hulkay. Mm -hmm. And we really felt that their influence extended far beyond the, this campus, that they broke the norm mm -hmm. for people throughout the country. So we are so pleased to welcome today Ula Taylor. I must mention that Ula is the second African-American woman to win the Distinguished Professor Teaching Award. The first, the first was Barbara Christian. Oh. And Pam Samuelson has had joint appointments in the School of Information and the School of Law since 1996. She has won a tremendous amount of respect for her work and we are just so pleased to have both of them, particularly because both of these women knew these individuals. So we want to welcome Ula first. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's so beautiful outside. Oh my gosh, spring is here. And I love it. Thank you for coming out um, this, I guess, early evening, late afternoon. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about Professor Barbara Christian and her legacy here today. Um, she was a dear colleague, and she earned her PhD in literature at Columbia University. Now, Columbia was her first choice because it's in Harlem, or near Harlem, as some people would say. And she knew the legacy of this creative intellectual community. She met Langston Hughes there prior to his 1967 death, and she was introduced to the works of other women writers, who we now place in that iconic literary canon, such as Zora Neale Hurston. She learned about them in Harlem while she was a student at Columbia. While she was a student, like many of our students here, she had to have a little extra job. And she worked as a lecturer at CUNY in their program SEEK, Search for Education, Elevation, and Knowledge. And this program aimed to bring the working poor and the edu educationally disadvantaged students to matriculate at City College. Tuition was free the books were free, and they provided a stipend. So it brought all of these folks from the community to the campus. SEEK also brought intellectuals together, like Barbara, who connected their teaching to the liberation struggle, to the women's movement, to the civil rights movement, to the black power movement. So other teachers who were a part of the SEEK program during the late 60s and early 1970s were Audre Lorde, Adrian Rich, Tony K. Bombera, Francie Francis Beale, and June Jordan. When she earned Barbara her PhD in America, American and British Literature in 1970, she had already honed her pedagogical skills in the company of brilliant writers and journalists and poets. In 1972, she was hired here at UC Berkeley. By the end of the academic year, in addition to Barbara, the department had successfully recruited other academically trained faculty. And I want to underscore academically trained faculty because when the department, when the program first came into existence, not all of the, the majority of the instructors had not earned PhDs. They were from the community. So this was a shift and transition in 1972 to bring like um, um, folks who had earned PhDs. So in addition to Barbara, Professor Charles Henry was brought here, uh, Henry Jackson, Reginald jo Jones, and, and Al Robotov. Barbara was the only woman amongst the group. 
And her appointment was the first time in the history of UC Berkeley that a black woman had achieved membership in the academic senate. In 1978, when she earned tenure, again, Barbara was the first black woman to earn tenure here at UC Berkeley. Yet it was her role as department chair from 1978 to 1983 that Barbara's leadership guided us into becoming a leader in the field. She expanded the cultural realm of the department by hiring Albert Johnson, who taught third world cinema, and Erskine Peters, who taught African American literature and cosmology. At the time, the department was heavily geared toward the social sciences. And so she felt the need to expand and bring in um, um, cultural additions and the humanities. In addition to the faculty, Barbara was pivotal in hosting creative writers and artists. It was because of Barbara that James Baldwin came to campus, that Alex Haley came to campus, that Alice Walker came to campus, that Gordon Parks came to campus, that Gil Scott Heron came to campus. Undergraduates were able to experience the life of the mind through the lens of these eminent scholars and artists. Now, some of these undergraduates continue to identify Barbara as their most important mentor and teacher. To this day, Yale professor of African American studies and music, Daphne Brooks, um, New York Times and best-selling um, um, author, um, Mar uh, Michael Datcher, and so many others talk about how Barbara's master teaching inspired them to really want to pursue a PhD and to become writer th writers themselves. As stated earlier, in 1991, Barbara received the Distinguished Teaching Award here at Cal. Again, she was the first black woman to receive this award. In our culture, we rightfully celebrate the first. But being in the position of being the first can be filled with multiple challenges, multiple tensions, multiple frustrations, and painful disappointments. I don't know how Barbara managed all of these possibilities, but I can say with confidence as a black faculty woman here at Cal that she had to be courageous. She had to be a bold thinker to know that she deserved tenure and that she was a master teacher prior to being affirmed by the university because there were no guarantees that it would happen. It would take another 22 years for the next black woman to receive the award for distinguished teaching. And as stated earlier, it's myself, even though I wasn't <laughs> going to tell you it was me. Okay. <laughs> Deeply committed to teaching and empowering students, Barbara was already um, um, teaching countless numbers of graduate students from the departments of ethnic studies and the department of English including the recent MacArthur um, recipient, Gabrielle Foreman. But she wanted our department to have our own graduate program. But there was a considerable amount of resistance to a PhD in African Diaspora Studies by the University of California. At every stage of the proposal writing, Barbara and her colleagues had to address two burning questions. First. Would there be a sufficient pool of interested persons? And second, would they gain academic employment? Loaded stereotypes haunted the review at every level. At the final stage, Barbara Christian, Margaret Wilkerson, who is also a wonderful um, 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 colleague, as well as Percy Henson, had to go to the university-wide review committee to defend the proposal and to ensure that it was approved. In 1997, the first class of 14 doctoral students arrived in the fall. Today and tomorrow, we are celebrating the 25th anniversary of our PhD program with the symposium. And you all are welcome to join us in the matrix. <laughs> Let me tell you, you always wanted to be on Barbara's team when it came to defending the interdisciplinary field of black studies, 
and its nuanced dim dimensions of knowledge. Her scholarship continues to have relevance in 2023. In particular, her 1987 essay, The Race to Theory. It shook up the field of literary criticism by arguing that literary theory was becoming too disconnected, too abstract, and ultimately excluded black women and other women of color. Barbara had a close relationships, relationship with black women writers that had been rooted when she was a lecturer through the SEEK program. Barbara was one of actually the first scholars to bring the works of Toni Morrison and Alice Walker to the attention of the Academy. Barbara knew the value of their work and other writers like Toni K. Bambera and Audre Lorde. Creative writers produce theory. I just have to say that again. Creative writers produce theory that is beautiful, that is accessible, and that includes a lot of different genres and styles. One of the most quoted sentences from this particular essay is, quote, so my method to use the new crit, crit word is not fixed, but relates to what I read and to the historical context of the writers I read and to the many critical activities in which I am engaged in, which may or may not involve writing. In addition to the race for theory, Barbara was one of the main editors for the Norton Anthology of African American Literature. And she, in addition to the books, she published over 100 articles. Um, but her most seminal single authored book was Black Women Novelists, The Development of a Tradition, 1892 to 1976. Collectively, all of this material cements her work in the field of African-American literary criticism. Barbara was born in St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands in 1943, and she died on June 25th, 2000 in Berkeley, California. I must share that the fact that Barbara only lived 57 years has struck me at my core recently because I turned 60 years old this year. The fact that I've outlived Barbara, it's sometimes it's just difficult to wrap my mind around. Especially when I came here, I was 29 years old. Um, I met her in 1992 um, when I was hired, but of course I knew her prior because of her scholarship. When I arrived on campus, she had just received that Distinguished Teaching Award the, and in 1994, she was honored for um, her distinguished contributions to ethnic studies <laughs> by the Society for the Study of Multi-Ethnic Literature of the United States. I was in awe of her professional accomplishments. Over time, however, I became even more inspired by her relationship with her students and her colleagues. She could set the tone of faculty meetings but she was always open to new ideas and new ways of thinking and doing. It just seemed like she had the ability to reset herself for the collective betterment, and it, I was in awe watching it. Today we talk a lot about collaboration and building community, but for Barbara, at least in my opinion, she genuinely engaged with others because she saw value in them and their work. She opened her lovely home to her colleagues, filled with plants and flowers, and her beautiful daughter, Najuma. It felt like a home and not a house. It looked like every corner was occupied by something special. We had parties that included the best Caribbean food you ever want to eat, <laughs> delightful conversation filled with humor and laughter, and music always filled the room and we were always dancing, and occasionally we resurrected the soul train line. <laughs> Her spirit continues to be so strong on the sixth floor of the social science building, and we count her as our intellectual black feminist foremother. Two months before Barbara passed in April of 2000, UC Berkeley awarded her with the highest honor, the Berkeley Citation. 
I remember sitting in the Morrison room and listening to all of her accomplishments. But what struck me the most was when Alice Walker came to the mic and she said that she didn't really understand what the Berkeley citation was, but she felt that Barbara deserved it and everything else <laughs> and that the university could give her. And I agreed with a hearty applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. first woman dean, and I was really, really, really happy to have a woman uh, as a dean. Uh, uh, but uh, this actually goes back for me um, uh, much farther than that, because uh, just before I, the year before I, I, I went to law school um, in the 70s, um, I, I moved to California to work up residency. I then I did college at, at University of Hawaii. And I, I moved here to build up residency so that I could go to Berkeley um, for law school. Um, and I found out while I was working that um, uh, in a city that she was teaching a class on uh, sex discrimination. And I, um, um, so she was teaching a class on women and the law. And I would get, sort of once a week, I would get, I would get off work at 5 o'clock I'd take a bus over to Berkeley, because I was downtown San Francisco, and then I'd go to the seminar for two hours, uh, and then take the bus back to uh, San Francisco, and then take a trolley home. So it was a long day for me. But um, she was such an inspiring teacher, and I had no idea how badly women had been treated in the law, and uh, so it was a real eye-opener for me. But it also really taught me that there was somebody who, who really, really, um, could be effective in bringing about change. And so um, I, I'm going to tell you a couple of the big accomplishments of her life, but um, uh, I thought it would probably be more useful for you to see just some pictures mm -hmm. of Herman because the, you, know, you don't get a sense of like who somebody is who's like famous and has all these accomplishments if you don't kind of like see what they actually look like. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to show these, uh, these pictures, and I'll, I'll start with them. Um, did I do the wrong thing? Yeah, I did the wrong thing. No. That's what I wanted to show. So that's, that was a, she had an amazing haircut all of her life. And she was always completely impeccably dressed. Um, and um, this isn't what she looked like when I was taking a class from her. Uh, but um, this is uh, her when she was a young uh, woman lawyer. Um, and um, they liked hats back then. <laughs> um, this looks like the Herma that I took a class from, um, and uh, she just was a, a wonderful presence in the, uh, in, the, in the classroom and a really devoted uh, teacher. Um, I would say her biggest accomplishments uh, have been uh, that she was the co-author of a 1969 uh, Family Law Act in California and uh, also of the Uniform Marriage and Divorce Act, uh, which became the kind of national standard uh, for uh, no-fault divorces um, in the country. So she made a big mark uh, in the country uh, through that, as well as through her teaching and her scholarship in family law, uh, conflicts of law, and uh, women in the law. Her most famous book uh, was a, a book uh, co-authored uh, for many years with uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, and uh, when we had the first uh, Herman Kay Memorial Lecture at, at Berkeley. Um, uh, Justice Ginsburg, uh, before she passed, came and uh, gave a, a talk, and it was the the entire Zellerbach was uh, mm -hmm. auditorium was uh, was um, uh, was full, and uh, you know Herma was really kind of the the center mm -hmm. uh, of uh, uh, the evening, and she's uh, um, uh, we've had we've, we just had yesterday the. Um, the, the fifth of the annual Herman Kay lectures. So 
I'm really happy that this has uh, been a way to carry on her memory. But let me just show you some more pictures. I mean, uh, I could give you lots of things. She was a dean of the law school. Oh, that was the first woman dean, yada, yada. She was actually only the 16th woman um, to become a law professor in the whole US of A. And she wrote a book about the first 15. Um, that was her kind of like last, lasting legacy um, in terms of her, um, um, her, uh, her way of contributing to the understanding of the field. So this is another of her in the classroom. I can see, you know, she just could really relate so well. This is a picture of her when she became uh, the dean. Um, here she was with a then small cohort uh, of women. This was actually right before I joined uh, the Berkeley faculty. Part of what's nice about things now is there are more than 20 women uh, who are um, uh, who are just or members of the faculty. So the fact that that back in uh, the 1960s she was like um, uh, she was uh, uh, only the 16th one in the whole country. Um, it's been a remarkable change, and she was part of the change agent. She wanted to hire women. She wanted to hire uh, people of color, uh, and um, uh, it was uh, um, much of her, much of the growth of the, the, the school in terms of sort of its diversity uh, came about because of, uh, of Herma. Uh, here she was with uh, former deans, um, and uh, um, you can see they were all male, uh, of course. Um, uh, here she is with the kind of characteristic lilt. She had a lot of personality. Um, uh, I really like that about her. Um, and notice her in the plane. She was actually a pilot. Um, and uh, she, uh, again, was uh, always very elegant. And that was her husband, uh, who uh, loved her dearly. Um, this was a, uh, an evening when the, some faculty members in Herma were engaged in a kind of a, uh, show, um, singing songs and making fun, uh, and uh, I wasn't there, but it sounded like it would be a fun event to do. Um, uh, she also liked softball, um, and here she was when we had a chance to do some construction um, in uh, the, the law school, so she needed a hard hat for that. Um, another picture of her with uh, Danish people, um, that was uh, Chris Edley and uh, Jesse Chopper, and Bob Baring was an acting dean for a while, um, uh, but she has a lovely smile, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. This is actually a signature jacket. And when, you, when you ever saw her McKay, the yellow jacket was like um, always going to be there. Okay. And, and um, so um, she used to show up at the faculty meetings. Not many people knew her that well because in the last years of her life, she didn't come to campus all the time. But, um, but that yellow jacket was like a signature thing. This is Eleanor Swift, uh, her dear friend and uh, colleague. And uh, I think one of the things that is remarkable about the partnership between Herma and, and Eleanor is that they were able to persuade the faculty, which is kind of stuck in the mud, kind of old faculty, um, uh, that clinical le legal education was really important. And so the first uh, the in-house clinics really got started because uh, the two of them really said, hey, you know, these people are going to practice law. Maybe it would be good if they actually had a chance to learn something about the practice of law by representing clients while they were still in law, law school. Today, this is known as, that used to be kind of denigrated because, oh, it's skills training, right? Mm -hmm. Skills training is like lower thing. <laughs> and now it's called experiential learning. <laughs> 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 that she had, uh, I, Eleanor would know all these people, but I don't, um, but I just love this. This is actually an award that, uh, uh, that um, a Lifetime Achievement Award that, uh, uh, that Herma Kay and uh, Justice Ginsburg got uh, at a WLS meeting um, uh, some years back now. Um, here she is uh, making remarks. Notice the yellow jacket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and there's the two of them. Uh, receiving their awards, and uh, you know, Justice Ginsburg had a nice, uh, a nice jacket too. But <laughs> <laughs> I like her as yellow one. So um, uh, I don't want to, you know, there are many, many accomplishments that I could talk about. But I think giving you a sense of the the live person who was uh, 
um, uh, such an important leader, uh, not only at the law school, but here, but also in the legal academy. She was the president of the Association of American Law Schools. Uh, she was also very active uh, in the American Law Institute, which is a kind of honorary society of lawyers um, and judges and uh, law professors who um, champion law reform projects. And so she really um, uh, was an extraordinary person uh, in her field uh, and much beloved and much missed by those of us who had the, had the good grace to know her. Anyway, thank you. and the Herma K. lecture that was just uh, delivered um, uh, yesterday uh, was uh, about the Equal Rights Amendment and mm -hmm. why isn't the Equal Rights Amendment actually mm -hmm. the law part of the Constitution and the argument was made very strongly, I think, that it should be. Uh, but, you know, they had to, you know, she and Justice Ginsburg, both through their teaching, uh, through their scholarship and then their activism, right, um, were pushing the boundaries, but you had to do it on a kind of, Case by case basis. So, you know, the I would say the the Family uh, uh, Act in California and the, the Marriage and Divorce Act were things that could have really moved things forward. But um, I'm sure it wasn't easy for those things to uh, uh, to be um, adopted. Um, uh, we look back in retrospect and it looked like, oh, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, there was always a lot of resistance, and of course. Um, you know, to persuade um, my kind of more stuck in the mud older faculty um, uh, to do the hiring, diverse hiring, and uh, to start the clinical program, uh, and to champion um, diversity in the student body as well as in the faculty. Um, there was a lot of resistance, and I, I know that Eleanor has all the details on this. That came mostly before I was here. She was, you know, by the time I got back to Berkeley um, uh, from that's 1972 when I first took the class um, and 1996 um, a lot had happened and so um, today it looks like you know oh of course no problem but um, uh, there were I know a lot of barriers but part of what's interesting about her she was unflappable you know she didn't lose her temper um, I never saw her lose her temper she was always very even keel very controlled um, and she didn't take um, she didn't take it off. She really was a you know, she, but she was firm. She wasn't you know loud about it. She was just a, um, found ways to overcome many barriers. Your question is great because it really allowed me to think. And I think when I first came here. Um, right out of graduate school. I think Barbara was of the mindset, you know, it's important to protect junior faculty. So I didn't really know all the things that she was facing and negotiating um, until she got ill. Um, and, it, and at the time that she got ill, I had just earned tenure. Um, and it was at that moment that it just kind of like, everything was exposed to me in terms of how not only, you know, she had the pressure to publish her, her own work, but also to negotiate and navigate a department that was very small in terms of FTEs, but the black students had so many expectations of the department beyond the 
academic intellectual course offerings, um, and how you ha and how one had to you know put out fires, you know, um, in terms of on campus or basically what was happening in the world and how it could spill over onto campus. But as she um, when she was ill, we began to have more conversations and. I learned that you know she had been a single mother here, and how when she she said at one point you know she would bring her daughter Najuma in the little car seat and just like plop her on the desk and start teaching, you know. So just even negotiating and navigating being a, 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 a young a, being a young professor and a single mother, I can't even imagine. Um, um, those kinds of, of, of challenges. I would also say too that um, at the time that Barbara, you know, was a, a full professor, she was like one of few full, full professors, just black people, let alone a black woman. The pressures constantly asked to be put on committees, academic senate committees, um, and. What happens if you say no, where is a certain kind of representation? And feeling the pressure, when can you actually say no? And in your no, will someone else say yes and offer comparable critique? So I think those are the kind of pressures that she had to um, negotiate. Can I mention something about what you said? I'm sorry? Can I say something about what you were talking about? about of course. Yeah. Okay, sure. Well, let me, let me just say that uh, Irma came to the law school in 1960. I came in 1961. And when Irma came, there was a senior woman who was on the faculty, who was a heavyweight, and uh, Barbara Armstrong. And uh, Bobby Barton was a lecturer. She didn't have professor status. But the law school was a very intimate family, Everybody knew everybody. Everybody had dinner parties with everybody else. It was a co completely different social environment. And in that environment, um, now I may be wrong about this, but this is my observation. Um, Herma was, of course, very, you know, she was very able and a wonderful person. Uh, but they, they, she, the, the, the the overall posture was one that but you could either say she was patronized or you could say that she was uh, protected. But it, it wasn't the kind of arm's length, uh, I would say characterized, but competitive uh, quality within an academic department that you had later where women had to really overcome a lot of prejudice. What, what she had to deal with was, was patronizing, was being promoted by the men on the faculty. Which was, so it was a different, and she had, you know, she had an inner drive that uh, made her a great success. So she went through that process. I don't know what it's like to get, you know, to patronize that way. I don't know. Uh, you know what? How what you're overcoming when you deal with that. But, but, but it was. I just wanted to say that it was a diff, at least in the law school, it was a different environment from what you sort of think about in the '70s when you came and there was a, a real new wave. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was a it, it was a kind of a family. Oh, she's it, it, she wasn't. Look down on. I don't mean that when I say David, but she. There wasn't a sense that she was a threat. <laughs> and I think later that's what would happen. Great. So I have a question, which maybe neither of you could <laughs> really answer. But uh, uh, one wonders about the early life of these two women. I mean, what is it in the upbringing, if you had to say to a parent, well, you know, here's how you raise a Herman L. K. or a Barbara Christian, can you even, either of you guess as to what, what that world was in which these women grew up? Well, I could say for Barbara, and I only know this just 
to prepare myself to come here, I just kind of did a little early history, and I was in, I knew some things, but not a lot. But her father was a judge. Her sister is a physician. So she was raised, I would say, in like a high achieving family structure yeah. in the Virgin Islands. All I know about her mom, uh, where she came from, was I think small towns in South Carolina. Uh, wow. And somehow she ended up at the University of Chicago uh, wow. for law school. And then she came out of here. The rest uh, was history. I think, I think her father was a Methodist minister. She went to SMU as an undergraduate. Okay. I would say that yeah, and Barbara was like, you know, I mean she came I think she had, she began undergraduate school at Marquette. I think she was like fifteen or sixteen. So she was very young. Uh -huh. So yeah. Yeah, unfortunately somebody should be writing the the the, the 60th uh, uh, book chapter for Herman's book that should be about her. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that would be uh, yeah, yeah. a yeah. yeah. service to do, but um, unfortunately, um, whatever memories there were, in <coughs> they're gone too. So yeah. that's, that's not too bad. Unfortunately, yeah. 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 Whatever led her to have the, the drive that she had, she helped other people have their drive to mm -hmm. find their drive. Um, and you know, I I just you know I, I was working as a paralegal in, uh, at a law firm downtown San Francisco because um, I figured I better work around some lawyers to see what I can stand being around me. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so I thought you know I'll 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 be around lawyers. And then I'll come over to listen to Herma uh, and feel what a law school classroom might be like. So I was like more prepared because I didn't have anybody in my family who was a lawyer or anything like that. So, um, but you know, somebody like Herma can basically say, "Hey, we can change this," you know, and that's that's the kind of thing that she helped other people be able to do. Well, I was fortunate to have Herma Hill Kay as okay. a professor. Um, she taught sex-based discrimination at that time, uh, and she was a really wonderful teacher. Actually, my question is directed more towards you talking about Barbara Christian, because, uh, and this relates to Tina's question about the earlier family life. Mm -hmm. um, I know that quite often um, people who are brought up here, um, minority mm -hmm. um, women or men, oftentimes have that conflict between pressures to assimilate mm -hmm. into the dominant culture, um, the majority culture at the time, versus maintaining your own family or ethnic heritage. And oftentimes they conflict. Mm -hmm. And my question about Barbara is, did she have any of those conflicts? Okay. And if so, do in her life um, any uh, particular emphasis towards assimilation versus trying to maintain one's own, um, I say, parental value system? Sure. I, I, I don't know. I, it would be hard for me to believe, or the Barbara that I knew was not trying to assimilate. Okay. <laughs>
every time there is something on Barbara, a, a talk, a, a, a conversation, a review of her work, I have to come if I can. Because as a young undergraduate student, she affected me so greatly. I took her Black Women Novelist yes. course in 1984, I believe. And uh, it was the most profound experience I've ever had as, as an undergraduate here. I'm a staff member here now um, for many years. But I, I just remember how much I never wanted to leave her class. I would always be late for my next class because <laughs> the students would collect in the front of the class wanting to talk to her more. You know, Toni Morrison and, and Paula Marshall and, and Adrian Rich and all these wonderful people. And Judy Jordan was a lecturer and Margaret Wilkerson. And you would think I would have been an African American studies major. I didn't. I was a Spanish major. <laughs> but I loved languages. But boy, I mean, she was incredible. And I just feel so, so, so grateful and, and fortunate for that, to have that experience. But she was, she was an impressive, incredible, authentic professor. And I loved her. So yeah. thank you. Uh, no, I, 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 you know what? And your testimony or your witnessing is what a lot of her former undergraduate students mm -hmm. say. It was the first time that they were introduced to, to authors that are now iconic and a part of a canon, yeah. but back then they weren't. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So in many ways, I mean, she earned her degree in British and American literature, not African American literature. You know, one couldn't even do it back then. Right. And so in many ways, you know, she was teaching a course and teaching a field that she had learned on her own, or she had learned outside of the academy. Maybe when she was at SEEK, you know, with Audre Lorde and Adrian Rich and June Jordan, you know, so she, um, um, so she came to the field in a more organic way. I would say, as opposed to a formal introduction in the classroom, the way that most young people are introduced to African American literature today. Well, I'm very grateful for you coming to this uh, event. It's nice to connect uh, people who have some resonances. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, I know that the, um, I know that Carol Chris. Uh, uh, has given remarks uh, on her early relationship with Herma Kay because uh, they were uh, young professors uh, here at a time when there were very few women on the uh, on the faculty of Grosville. It wasn't just the law school where they were um, pretty rare. Um, and so uh, it's nice to kind of know that you know there are still some of us out there who have this uh, uh, this fond memories and ways that we can try to keep. The memories a lot. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.